who haven't participated in my lessons yet, my name is Ania Wielkopola I work in Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. And today we're going to talk about um, environmental toxicology, at least some elements of it. We're going to talk about toxins, how they affect organisms, and also how they're included into environmental sex. Two things uh, to begin with. Um, we're going to finish with a Kahoot quiz, uh, if we have enough time, hopefully. So please prepare your smartphones or computers, um, and of course listen carefully. And also I prepared a worksheet for you. Uh, you can treat it as, a, um, as something to help you to follow the lesson or uh, as a, maybe a um, homework for later. Uh, and we're going to come back to that uh, too. So first, uh, and also the third thing, I'd like to ask you to be active today and uh, to begin with, a short question just to warm you up. Do you know any toxins, any toxic substances? Here's a definition of toxicity and if you could name uh, or at least think um, of something uh, uh, that you think is toxic. 30 seconds. And please, uh, if you have any ideas, write them on chat. Um, I would say you probably thought of um, some chemicals, maybe known from Agatha Christie books like arsenic, but here's the thing that nearly 500 years ago, a Swiss uh, physician and chemist Paracelsus, this guy here, uh, expressed the basic principle of toxicology. All things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose make a thing poison or not a poison. This is often condensed to uh, solar dosis facit venenum. Uh, the dose uh, makes the, po the, the poison, here you can see it in, in Latin. It means that a substance that contains toxic properties can cause harm only if it occurs in high enough concentration. In, in other words, any chemical, even water, even oxygen, can be toxic if too much is ingested or absorbed into the body. The toxicity uh, of a specific substance depends of, uh, on a variety of factors. Uh, how much of the substance a person is exposed to, how long, how are they exposed to, etc., etc. So uh, you can see here that even toothpaste may be toxic if we consume to quite a lot because 33 mm, tubes, whole tubes at once. Um, some people are also very concerned about potential harmfulness of vaccines because the vaccines contain formaldehyde. But in fact, it is so tiny that it doesn't even affect the level of formaldehyde in children's blood. And for example, a pear, a natural pear, a fruit, healthy fruit, contains much more formaldehyde naturally. Even water, which is crucial for survival, can be lethal. Uh, it all depends on dose, because if, uh, for example, if a person uh, drank six liters, liters of water, it would be fatal for, for, for humans. So, uh, that awful chemistry, we often try to avoid chemistry in life, we're trying to live all natural, we check ingredients of food, which is good, it's good to be a conscious uh, customer, uh, consumer, uh, but we shouldn't be afraid of chemistry in general. Because all of it, the air we breathe is composed of chemicals like nitrogen, oxygen, uh, argon, carbon dioxide. We brush our teeth with toothpaste that, um, it, that contains fluoride. Um, at breakfast, we drink orange juice, um, and that contains naturally occurring uh, ingredients like acrylamide, fructose, aldehyde. Uh, so uh, look at those all natural products described in a chemical way, like. Um, here is metal paraben um, in blueberries. In banana, there is a oxalic acid some, somewhere. This is not contamination. This is all nature, but explained in a scientific uh, way. But of course, there are products, either natural or mostly human-made, that can have very severe health consequences. Can be extremely harmful to living organisms and endanger the whole ecosystem even in relatively small doses. 
Here are some examples of so famous or infamous um, toxic substances that are extremely dangerous and affect vulnerable um, ecosystems. And also, they tend to bioaccumulate and remain in the environment for a long time. And as you can see here, people were not always aware of harmfulness of certain products. And here you can see one of the most toxic, most famous toxic products on DDT, and the old commercial of it that DDT is good for me. So this is DDT. What is DDT? It's dichlorodiphenylcichloroethan. Uh, from chemical point of view, it looks like this. This is the construction of the particle. And uh, the story of DDT um, begins with uh, malaria carrying mosquitoes. Because first it was synthesized in 19th century, but then it was forgotten, but, but rediscovered in 1939 by Dr. Paul Müller. And he was awarded a Nobel Prize for this, for this discovery. Uh, because it was very helpful, it helped actually in the beginning to save thousands of people, thousands of lives, and countless more, uh, because it helped to fight malaria in, in many regions. It eradicated uh, those mosquitoes, uh, who were, which were carrying um, malaria, and this, is, this was very helpful in the beginning. It was cheap, it was easy to synthesize, and it was long-lasting, and this is one of the problems with it. And in the beginning, scientists said that it was not dangerous uh, for, uh, for health or for humans, but uh, that, changed, uh, that changed in time. So it was used widely to mosquito control efforts, and uh, it was sprayed, people sprayed it on the walls, on the ceiling of houses, on public buildings, in, a, in, a, in abandon. And um, successful application could remain on those surfaces for six months. So, but after a period of time, long-term effects of DDT began to show. And the populations of many animals, birds, fish in particular, began to decrease rapidly. Because the effect of DDT of, on human health is not that much noticeable as uh, the influence on ecosystem. Uh, because DDT can affect, well, in humans it can affect hormone production a, a little bit, but it affects uh, animals, especially egg-laying animals, that's why I said um, birds and, and fish in particular. And because it decreases thickness of eggshell, and uh, this, uh, this is very dangerous for whole population. Also DDT be easily becomes embedded in fat stored in animals, and in, it can remain there for many, many years. This is one of the uh, things that distinguishes those toxins, that they last in the environment um, and in tissues for many, many years. So this is, uh, uh, this is the chemical structure of DDT. It is a chlorinated hydrocarbon. Uh, like I said, it's a pesticide. And its half-life is 15 years, which means that if you use 100 kilograms of DDT, it will eventually break down but uh, has a long-term effect because it's, it, um, for example, after 15 years, 50 kilograms of DDT still remain in the, in, the, in the environment and so on and so on. So it has dangerous long-term effects. Then we have heavy metals. Uh, some heavy metals are essential nutrients, are very important for our health, like iron, like cobalt, like zinc. Some are relatively harmless, like silver, like indium, for example, but uh, could be toxic in larger amounts. But there are other heavy metals, like cadmium, like mercury, like lead, that are highly poisoned. And um, potential sources of poisoning are mining, tailing, uh, industrial waste, uh, agriculture, uh, paint. Uh, timber production, etc., etc. So heavy metals are in Mendeleev's uh, table are basically <coughs> those those here. Uh, so mercury, do you recognize this photo here? It's from a movie. 
the character of a movie and also a character of a book from Alice in Wonderland by Louis Caller, and this is obviously um, Johnny Depp as Matt Hatter. Matt Hatter um, uh, is one of the most famous characters of, of this book, but have you ever asked yourself why would a hatter, a person that makes hats, be mad? And this is exactly because of Mercury, and this is a true story uh, on which the, the character in the book was based. It was used, Mercury was used uh, in the past by hatters to make hats. And hatters separated sperm from skin of animals in the process, it, that was called carotting. And uh, as Mercury was used, they were exposed to lo loads of it. And this caused so-called eretism, eretism or eretism mercurialis. It's a neurological disorder uh, which affects the whole central nervous, um, uh, nervous system of, of a person. And it was also sometimes known as Mad Hatter uh, disease. It was very common among English um, hat makers. Also, <clears throat> for centuries, mercury was, was used in medicine, for example. Uh, in diuretics uh, as antibacterial uh, method, antiseptic, laxative. Uh, so uh, it was widely used for uh, human human health. But symptoms of mercury exposure, this erotism, are irritability, low self-confidence, depression, apathy, shyness, timidity, and um, some are also headaches pain, tremors after a, a large exposure to, to mercury. And now, mercury is present in different forms, many different forms. Um, quicksilver, for example, in old thermometers, probably you now only use electronic old thermometers, but when I was a child, it was uh, an old thermometer with quicksilver. Um, but also chloride and also organic mercury. And uh, organic mercury is methyl mercury. Uh, it's a main form of mercury to which environment and humans are exposed. It, uh, met methyl mercury is uh, composed of methyl group and uh, it is bonded to mercury ion. It looks like, like this. It is formed from inorganic mercury by the microbes that live in the water, in the water aquatic systems, rivers, lakes, uh, wet soils. And natural uh, sources of mercury are volcanoes, forest fires, um, etc. The, then this mercury goes to water system and microbes um, make it a metal mercury. Okay. Then, uh, then we have PBCs uh, among the most famous and most dangerous long-term toxins in the environment. PCBs are uh, polychlor polychlorinated bisphenols. It's a group of man-made organic chemicals. They consist of carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine atoms. The, the particle looks a bit like this. They have no taste, no, sm uh, no smell, and uh, they can be look like oil or, or wax. And although they're forbidden now, they're no longer produced, they can be still present. For example, in old electrical devices, cables, uh, old oil-based paints, um, etc., etc. They do not break down once in the environment. They also remain for long periods cycling between air, water, uh, soil, and also they can be carried long distances. And they were found in snow and seawater in areas far from where they were released into their environment. So they can be found all over the world and consumed by us with food without even, uh, without even knowing it. And it is dangerous for health because, for example, uh, there were experiments that rats that ate food containing high levels of PCBs developed liver cancer. cancer. So there is a connection between the consumption of this and Mm, serious, serious disease. So we basically know what are the sources of those uh, toxic, toxic substances, but how exactly are they incurred into living organisms? The answer is via 
environmental cycle. Talking about those cycles, many people confuse two terms. And you also have it on your uh, chart. So you have to match definition with, uh, uh, with a term. So we have, for example, bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Uh, and these words are encountered when dealing with issues concerning the buildup, the growing level of toxic substances in body of organisms, and ultimately also in, in human, uh, human body. So first, bioaccumulation. It occurs within an organism where a concentration of a substance uh, builds up in tissue and it is absorbed faster than it is uh, removed. Uh, it is happening in two ways, that eat by eating contaminated food or by absorption directly from water, by fish, for example, which are surrounded by water. And uh, the important thing is it is the, like a first uptake of, uh, of substance into our own organism. It can happen on any trophic level, any level of food chain, uh, but the result is in, inside the organism the level of the concentration of substance is higher than the concentration of substance in the surrounding environment. And why is it uh, happening. Actually, if you think about it, it's a very natural, regular process that normally allows us to survive because organisms normally accumulate essential nutrients, proteins, vitamins, to survive. We take some food and we accumulate them, accumulate those essential, uh, essential nutrients. But unfortunately, the same happens with toxins. Uh, we take them with respiration, by eating food, uh, via epidermal contact, that is through skin, and the result, there, there is a buildup. There is more and more, the levels of those toxins are higher and higher over time. And uh, the accumulation depends on many things, uh, like level of concentration in the environment, how long are we exposed to it, um, or, and also on the organism itself, how old is the organism, uh, what species, etc. But it can be also used in strange ways uh, for for the benefit of organisms. For example, this this frog is a poison dart frog, and it accumulates external poison and uses it as their own as their own weapon. So it's one way to use the toxin from from the surrounding environment. And accumulation is measured, of course, in ppm, part per million. And for example, if we have oysters, they can concentrate those infamous DDT from this level in C, 0.001 ppm in C, to 700 ppm in their body. So it's a high rate of accumulation. And then we have biomagnification. Uh, also known as bioamplification, uh, magnification or amplification means basically the same. It can occur in almost all types of ecosystem, terrestrial ecosystem, uh, aquatic ecosystem. And what is this? It's a tendency of pollutants uh, to increase their levels, but as they move from one organism to the next, it means that they are not metabolized, they do not disappear, but for example, there is uptake from, from water, there is a plankton eaten by zooplankton, and uh, the level, the concentration of toxins is getting higher and higher from zooplankton to small fish, from small fish to large fish, and to, from large fish to, fire, for example, fish eating birds, or from, from large fish to seals, and from seals to polar bears. So this is how our fight with mosquitoes, with malaria, influences uh, polar bears, they, they have high levels of DDT. Not all substances are able to biomagnificate. There need to be uh, several conditions. They have to be long-lived, they have to be mobile, that means that they can move from one environment to the other without breaking down. Also, they have to be soluble in fats, that means that 
can accumulate in fats for their storage. And also they're um, biologically active. Uh, persistent, they can be broken down by natural environmental processes and do not de degrade uh, because they, if they are soluble in fats, they are in fact not non-soluble in water, so they do not degrade in, uh, in water. So here's a short table showing uh, differences between persistent pollutants that are able to bioaccumulate, uh, biomagnificate, and short-lived uh, pollutants. Uh, so persistent pollutants, like I said, dissolve in fats, uh, cannot be diluted, can, do not break down, uh, they are not uh, excreted, they're not, uh, you can't, uh, organisms can get rid of them uh, by uh, urine, uh, etc. It, it is not possible. They accumulate in fatty tissues because organisms have no enzymes, no possibilities to, uh, to degrade them naturally. So once again, here you can see a difference with, between bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Uh, bioaccumulation is a gradual uptake in time, like in the same organism and biomagnification from one trophic level to another. But uh, of course there are some, uh, some things that bioaccumulation and biomagnification have in common because toxins are ingested and bioaccumulation can lead to biomagnification also. And uh, the obvious thing is that concentration of the toxins gets higher over time in both cases. Also, we have an interesting uh, contrary uh, phenomenon. It is biodilution. And uh, this is uh, usually happening in eutrophic uh, environments. What does it mean, eutrophic? In rich environments, nu nutrient rich environments. Because nutrient uh, enrichment, like when there's lots of nitrogen, when there's lots of phosphorus, reduce for example, the input of uh, mercury and uh, other heavy metals into aquatic uh, food webs. So, um, uh, primary producers such as phytoplankton uptake these heavy metals, ac accumulate them, but there's not so many of them. So, what exactly is the dilution? It's the decrease in concentration of pollutants with increase in uh, with increase in trophic levels when it, with Food, uh, food web. So um, it is the observed trend that um, an increase in algal biomass with, uh, will it reduce the overall concentration of a pollutant per cell because also if there is lots, lots, lots of cells of algae, the concentration per one uh, cell is smaller. And it ultimately it contributes to a lower dietary input to, to grazers because uh, those organisms eat those algae uh, can um, eat less, con smaller concentrations of those pollutants, of those uh, toxins. So this is also possible, but uh, usually in marine environments, but generally in eutrophic rich environments. Uh, also, uh, there's a phenomenon called synergism. That means that two pollutants or more pollutants uh, may interact to produce toxic effects, which is greater than the effects of two uh, pollutants simply uh, added together. So, uh, for example, when we have high concentration of lead, zinc, and mercury, uh, each is, is capable of producing growth rate of aquatic animals a little bit. But when those three are acting together, their overall effect is much, much higher and much more dangerous for the ecosystem. So how do we measure pollutants? Usually uh, it is measured by measuring its level in fatty tissues, for example, in, in a fish and in mammals, we often test the milk uh, where toxins are, uh, are, accumu are accumulated. Uh, 
for the uh, example you hear, here you have, you have uh, examples of toxins and uh, where do they come from and how do they affect um, organisms, how do they affect our health. For example, we have mercury that affects um, nervous system, also reproduction, and um, it can come from like gold mining, for example. Uh, we have um, PCBs that can um, influence reproduction. Uh, other can cause cancer, and etc., etc. And uh, as for the effects of bioaccumulation on humans. Um, we usually say that eating fish is healthy, but actually, uh, well, from, from one point of view, it is lots of proteins and important uh, nutrients, but uh, alarming levels of toxic mercury were found in 264 samples of popular fish, uh, in, especially in Asian uh, cuisine. So all those things are good for our heart, for our bones, proteins, fatty acids, but also um, they can be dangerous because of bioaccumulation, because of mercury levels they, they have. And one of the examples is a uh, history of um, Minamata disease. Uh, this is Minamata uh, disease uh, written in, in Japanese. Um, the story of Minamata disease should be a warning to us. Um, here we can see a, quite a drastic photo because it's a crippled hand of a Minamata disease victim. Minamata uh, is a city uh, in Kumamoto in Japan. In uh, 1956, uh, there was a release of methylmercury in the industrial wastewater from a, cor from a corporation, from a chemical factory nearby. Uh, actually, it continued for 30 years, and highly toxic chemicals uh, bioaccumulated in shellfish and fish in Minamata, in Minamata Bay here. Uh, and uh, he here's where uh, local uh, population got food from, fish mainly, and it resulted in mercury poisoning. And it was uh, it killed lots of uh, humans, but also cats, dogs, pigs. It continued for 36 uh, years, and uh, the government, the company, did little to prevent their uh, pollution. And um, as for March uh, 2001, more than 2,000 victims have been officially recognized of, as having this Minamata disease, which was, which was a neurological disorder related to methamercury, uh, of course. So, uh, is eating fish healthy? That depends. Uh, here are uh, examples of fish with high levels and low levels of mercury. As for high levels, we have uh, king mackerel, swordfish, tilefish, and shark. And as for low levels, uh, we have carp, trout, crab, scallop, and salmon. So, as for, like I said, we have carp here, we have shark, we have uh, scallop, we have king crab, we have mackerel, and also a trout, and salmon here, tilefish, and swordfish. This is exactly what is in your uh, what's in your worksheet. So I let you look at it for for a while and repeat. Which one is which one? Swordfish, carp, tilefish, shark, trout, crab, king mackerel, salmon, this is the easy one, and scallop. So this is fish and shellfish, seafood in general. And but what can we do? But fortunately, there are ways to detoxicate ourselves. Uh, from heavy metal by, for example, eating particular herbs like milk thistle. It is getting quite popular uh, nowadays, this milk thistle in lots of, lots of forms. Uh, but also, uh, 
food rich in sulfur. Rich in sulfur food is broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, spinach, onion. Also, consuming lots of fermented food allows us to detoxicate from heavy metals in particular. So, uh, fermented food like yogurt, kefir drinks, pickled cucumbers, lots of lots of that kind of food. Also, drinking lots of, uh, lots of water is good for detoxication, but look at this. Uh, we have also green tea and uh, chocolate that is good for our health in this case, so I think it's quite a good news. So, thank you very much uh, for this, uh, for, for today.